All right, so we're going to pick up where we left off last week. Um, of all the topics for SQL, today's lecture is going to be um, either really easy for you or really hard for you. It's to do joins or subqueries. Depending on how your brain is wired, you're either going to get it like this or you're going to suffer till you get it. Uh, no, no, really, it's from teaching this for the last 12 years. I've noticed like the class can, you can almost draw a line right down the middle of the class. One half gets it right off the bat. One half suffers. Why? I've yet to figure out what it is that causes that divide. And I'll be completely honest. It's just some people's brains work one way. Some other people's brains work another way. It's not even syntax. It's just understanding how it's done, like what the implications are of how it works. So today we're going to cover two separate topics. Um, showing you two different ways to pull data from multiple tables at once. Uh, the first one is the subquery. Well, listed on the slide, the first one is the subquery, and the second one is the join. For some unknown reason, all the slides are in a random kind of order. Um, but we'll cover them both today. Um, so both subqueries and joins work with multiple tables, but they're used for different purposes. Like they have a totally different purpose. Um, sometimes some people will get lazy and they'll abuse subqueries because they don't understand how to do joins. So they'll do a subquery instead to achieve most of the task of the join. But the problem with this, with the two, uh, well, I'll show you the differences, but they're, they really don't do the same thing. Um, and they have different performance impacts. Okay. So. Last week we covered, and over the last two weeks, we covered something that looks similar like this, right? Where we go, we want to add up everything for a given table, where in this case, the SKU's in this list of values. So it just shows you the in, it's the where, this is nothing new. However, there is a much better way to do this. And it is, what happens if you don't know what the SKU's are? Which is actually, when you write queries in an application, you should never assume what the values of the IDs are be in this case, the SKUs. Um, because then it's something called magic numbers. Magic numbers are a very bad thing in programming. There's nothing I enjoy more than pulling up somebody else's code and go, if result equal 352, then. What's 352? It means nothing. It's a magic number. It's a number, and probably at some point, you know, there was like this one case where 352 was applicable and they hard coded it into the code. And probably by now, 352 is not even a thing. Um, so, what happens if you don't know what, in this case, what the SKUs would be? So, you could do select SKU from SKU data and it would give you the list of SKUs. Great. So, now what we can do is we can combine the subquery. And the original query is a single item. And if you look at this, really all it is is the exact same two queries we saw, except instead of having the list of SKUs, we have another query inside that bracket. This is known as a subquery. And it's known as a subquery because it runs first, just like when you do math and you resolve your parentheses. What this does, it'll run the query on the inside grab all the results of that query and pass it as a, basically a list to the query on the outside, effectively turning it into a comma delimited list. Um, I can demonstrate this with the sample code so it makes a little bit, a bit of sense for you guys. Okay, so if I go select star from orders, right? This is that database that you guys have if you wanted to play along, right? Oops. Where customer ID in select ID, come on, Dan, from customers where, uh, what the heck did I call the column? You know, I work with this table enough, you think I'd remember. Region. We're going to go with Yukon because I know there's data for Yukon. And we're going to run this. 
And I got an error. Oh, yeah, because it's customer ID. Okay, so what it's doing is when you look at, if it runs this query first, and there it is, there's a list of customer IDs. And then it runs the outer query with that result. And if you look at the column here, you'll see there's 1884, you know, 100. These are the customers that are listed in Yukon. And we have subquery. So effectively, this is as if you were you knew all of these values, ran it as did a common delimited version of this, 10, 18, 84, comma, whatever. It takes that result and passes it to the outer query. Uh, if I do the explain, you can see it did a full table scan on the customer, basically found the list, because that's where it did the search. And then it does the lookup in the um, or customer orders table. It does a nest loop and basically loops through the results where it matches and passes it out. So you can see it's actually running two queries and it's taking the results of query, query one, which is the red one, passes it into query number two, which is the green one. Um, the subqueries are amazingly powerful. Um, however, it comes at a cost. How many queries did I just run? Two. Well, that means that it need to work twice. Actually, more than twice, if you think about it, because it did the results of one, then it took the results, packaged them up, and passed them out to the outside one, then ran the second one. Would you notice it in practice? Maybe, depending on how big your data set is. So queries are cool that way. But they can be expensive if you're not careful. There is a couple of this for subqueries. Um, so I'm just going to keep going with all my examples and discuss them, and then we'll see how many slides I'm going to skip. Because actually, I'd rather explain it to you guys in my own words than the slides. Okay, so this is a subquery period. This is a subquery in a where clause. This is pretty much the only time you call it a subquery. There's an other way to use this. So if I go select sum of total from order lines, uh, group, not group, group by order ID. And go. All right, so cool, nothing new. I showed you guys this week, last week, I mean, not this week, last week. Remember, when I discussed how you cannot run an aggregate on an aggregate, now I can with the subquery. So I'm going to give this an alias. And I'm going to go in and add in order ID even, just to be nice, just so that we know. That's funny because somebody, I just heard her over there and I think she actually, the second the other shoe just dropped for her as she realized what I'm about to do. So I just ran my query. Fantastic, right? Now, this is no is also going to be a subquery, but this is a special kind of subquery known as either as a virtual table or a derived table. And this is how you use it. Let's go select star from. And this is where you need the alias no matter what. And by the way, you can call this anything you want. It doesn't care. I'm just going to call it D table as derived table. And I'm going to run my query looks no different. Right? Nobody's like, this is cool. It doesn't look any different. But now what I can do is I can go and voila, here's my aggregate on the aggregate. Let's let's try to let's try to digest this a little bit. All right, so Here's my original query. Fantastic. We got totals per order for each order. It's actually a very important number for most companies. You need to know how much the person spent. <laughs> now, it's being run as a subquery because, well, it's in parentheses. That basically tells it it's going to be a subquery. 
However, if you don't include the alias, I'm just going to take that off, and I, I'll show you guys why, you get an error. Every derived table must have its own alias. This is why the second it's run as part of the from, it becomes a table temporarily in memory. It literally creates an object in memory that is a table. It looks like a table. It smells like a table. It even respects the, the keys from the underlying tables. It acts like a table, smells like a table, it looks like a table. However, it's a table with a major issue. It has no life. It runs, it's born, it ceases existing. It only exists for the lifetime of the query, and then the results are tossed. Therefore, if it's going to be a table that looks like, acts like, and smells like, it has to have a name. Therefore, it has to have an alias. So remember when I talked about aliases two weeks ago? That's one of the big reasons why you need them. So at this point, this is a normal table as far as the query optimizer is concerned. So now you can run all the aggregates on it you want. Like this. And now I can run my totals. And I can do some pretty nice stuff with it. Um, amongst other things, I could actually give it counts of count of how many lines there is, all kinds of that kind of stuff. So that is literally a subquery used as a derived table. And there is one other item that where you can use your um, subqueries. And this is super powerful and super stupid at the same time. It's super powerful when you're using it when you're creating new data sets. When you are not sure what the IDs are for something, but you want to know um, a country, but you don't know what the ID is. Um, do I actually have a data set for this in here? Yeah, no, no, but it's not, it's not a good data set for this. Uh, hang on, do I have this installed? No. I want to show this, but I can't show it with this data set. Oh, come on. I'm just going to drop into a different database real quick. Totally different database, but I just wanted to demonstrate this. So I do have a data set where this works. It's just not in my normal. Come on, oh, this tool's so slow to load. No, no, there's just a country field. I want to show what this does. Hang on. This just takes a second to start. Hang on, it's coming. Eventually. I honestly don't know why it's so slow to launch, because once it's launched, it's fast. But it takes forever to launch. Actually, it usually doesn't take this long either. Oh, I know why it is. I'm recording. And my laptop's not happy about it. No. It's not the world's most powerful laptop. It even says it's taking longer than usual. Uh, okay, anyways, I'm going to continue talking about this while I wait for this thing to finish coming. Oh, come on. And is, Did it say that? Oh, there it goes. Started. But it's still not started. There it goes. Yay. Well, this is a different database engine. It's not MySQL. But it's going to let me demonstrate because this will let you do either. All right. So select ID from countries where name is equal to Canada. Take the A and I go go. All right. So there's the ID. Now let's just say I was trying to do select. And I was just trying to insert a new customer, right? So if I want to go, well, actually, I could do this for starters. Uh, select uh, Bob, comma, demo, comma. Whew. 
like this. And that's just going to do it. It's just going to display it. However, what it's doing is it's populating a row with a value being pulled from another table, which is where, when I was saying earlier, where some people abuse subqueries, they abuse them like this because they're lazy. Actually, I can absolutely demonstrate this one, how that would work, and the danger of doing it with this database. If I go name, comma, city, select name from countries where ID is equal to customers.id. Where uh, customer underscore ID less than three hundred. Hope this works. Uh, no, it should just be ID. And actually, that didn't work. That's kind of cool uh, because this should be. All right. So this is somebody who doesn't want to write a join because they understand how to do a subquery. Now, this is a special kind of subquery because it's known as something that's called as a correlated subquery. And this is the most expensive kind of query you can write, bar none. Every other query so far that looked expensive has been pennies on the dollar. This one is dollars on the dollar. <clears throat> and all right, so this one does a similar explain um, where you can see it does a scan of countries. It merges into the customer. Um, and somehow, my results are almost um, on. Don't do this to me. Oh, no. I usually don't use this tool very much. But so what's happening is now you can't even see the query. There it is. Okay. So what this is doing is it's running that subquery for every row it finds. That's why it's called a correlated subquery. That's why it's expensive. So I said where the ID for customers is less than 300. That means it's going to run that subquery 300 times. So I'm going to run 400 queries for this one query. Subqueries are cool. When you use them in the select statement like this as a correl what they call a correlated subquery, they're not cool. They're expensive because you're running 400 times. Now, this particular database engine that this is being run against is very, very good at caching. So what it'll do is it'll say, hey, I've already seen this country ID, so I don't need to go look for it a second time. It'll grab it out of, out of memory. MySQL, not so good at this. So different database engines will let you get away with different levels of data. Uh, if I were to take that restriction off and try to run against the whole data set. So that took half a second for 5,700 rows. It should not take half a second for 5,700 rows. It shouldn't even come close to taking that long. It's no, but it's because it's expensive. It has to run so many times. Pardon? You should avoid it unless you need it. And like I said, the best place for it is when you're doing insert statements. So if you don't happen to know the ID for a given country, you could write it like this. Insert into customers. Name, comma, country ID. I don't actually have the data for this in this, but I'll show you guys what it would look like. Bob, comma, select ID from countries where country name is equal to Canada. Oops. And that, oh, I forgot to forget my last parentheses. This would allow you to do an insert without knowing what the ID of the country is. So when you're generating data for things like, you know, test data, it's a really good way to not have to worry about what the foreign keys are because you can ask the database to give them to you. 
by doing something like this. So this is not a correlated subquery because unlike the other one where it was referring to itself, right? Because it was referring to the query on the outside. It's not correlated. So this was not expensive. It only runs once for the outer query. So correlated is good. It's expensive. Other subqueries are a little bit more expensive, but they're not that bad. Okay. So those are the three kinds of subqueries. Now, how many slides did I just blow through during my demo? Yeah, showed that one. Oh, this is just showing that you can nest as many as you want. Well, in this case, none of these are correlated. So it's only going to be one, two, three queries. It's going to take, run the first one, grab the results, pass it to the second one, get the results, pass that out to the third one. It is not going to be as efficient as a join, which I'll be showing you guys in a bit, but it's not that bad. Now, if this was a correlated subquery, uh, years and years ago, when I first started teaching this course, I actually had an example where it blue screened my laptop. Um, I used to do it right at the end of this, lect of this particular topic because I didn't want to have to reboot my machine halfway through the lecture. Um, it would literally take so long to run that MySQL would blue screen my laptop. Mind you, that was also Windows XP. So it gives you an idea how long ago it's been, right, since I did that. Uh, but I literally had four nested subqueries that were all correlated to each other. And uh, literally it just ran and just, you could see my mouse just start going chug, 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 blue screen. Um, if you write queries like that, you deserve all the pain you get. Just saying. So this is nested. It's cool. No problem. So I literally covered extra topics about subqueries that aren't even going to be on the exam because they're useful, especially the derived table. That's actually out of everything I just showed you guys. That's the important one. Using a subquery in your where clause is cool because you're just avoiding, you know, having to figure out values. But there's a still a much better way to do it than a subquery, which is this topic, the joins. And you guys get lucky because when I went through school, joins were painful to do. They had just been added not that long ago. Well, they've been added not that long ago, 10 years. They've been added to the standard, but almost nobody had them. And the only SQL databases that were widely available was Oracle, IBM DB2. Microsoft SQL Server wasn't out yet. Uh, it was Watcom SQL at the time. That's what it was called. Watcom. Uh, it was a database engine written by University of Waterloo. What, you know, Waterloo Computer. Watcom SQL. They also had Watcom COBOL, Watcom Pascal, Watcom. You know, they put out all this stuff for free. And that's what became SQL, Microsoft SQL Server. So people just did whatever they wanted to do with joins. They said, we are going to provide the functionality, but we're going to write it whichever way we want. And finally, the standard came out, which is what you, I'm going to be teaching you guys. Okay, so again, we're going to query multiple tables. Um, in a join operation, uh, we're going to use the join operator to do it correctly. Uh, before we get to the join operator, I will discuss a few of the other ways of doing this, which are legacy. But when you go on the internet and you go, Hey, Chad GPT, show me how to do a join. I love that I could actually make that joke now. Uh, I've been waiting for years to say, hey, you could add, you know, it used to be, hey, Google. Then you type in the word uh, stack overflow space, how to do a join, right? Now it's just you ask Chad GPT and it gives you a freaking article uh, with examples. Um, but you may, when you search on the online and how to find this, you may see what the legacy ones, the implicit style joins. So we're going to talk about those first so we can stop thinking about them. Okay. So there's two kinds of join. There's the explicit join, which uses the keyword called join. And then there's the implicit join where the keyword join is not used. Implicit joins are not great. They're tricky. It's easy to make mistakes, and they tend to be a little more expensive to run than the ones that use an explicit join. Like with everything else in a computer, the more explicit you are in your instructions, usually the better it runs, the more efficient it's going to be. Databases are no different. 
just because the programmers that created the data, the SQL language and the different implementations were very clever people. And I'm not saying that, you know, the guys who created SQL, my, my SQL were stupid. They just started out with really bad code. Okay, and they've been stuck with the results of that. Okay, so there are four kind of joins. They have natural joins, inner joins, outer joins. So those are left and right joins. Full and cross join. You can mix and match any of these in a single query. So you can do a left outer join with an inner join. It's cool. It'll work. Um, you can use joins on tables, views, and materialized views. Something that is not listed here, derived tables. You can use it as against the derived table as long as you have a, a key in it. So if you include the primary key of whatever it is you're pulling, like I did in my example, in theory, you could still do a join. So a natural join. A natural join creates a join based on common attributes. And the requested results, the common columns are request returned only once. Duplicated columns are eliminated. If there's no column, co common column names, the result turns into Cartesian. So it's a cross join. So a natural join can accidentally turn into a cross join. So this is me going on the record for saying natural joins should not exist. Because the way they do it, it assumes that the database is designed a very specific way and it will only ever work a very specific way. And depending what programming language you're using or what framework you're using or what coding standard company works for is using, 95% chance the natural join will never work ever in your life. So here's what it does. Select star from table one, natural join table two. Fantastic. What it then does is the query analyzer goes, let's look at table one. What attributes do we have? What fields are here? Table two, what fields are here? Do we have any fields that match? Yes, we're joining on that. Fantastic. Now what happens if both primary keys are called ID? Magically, it's gonna join across the primary keys. That's not how that works. Primary key to foreign key. What happens if your primary keys are, have some weird name and then it finds the very first field called name? Because I don't know, you're trying to join a customer to the country's table and just so happens that the descriptor field for country's name and the customer's descriptor's name. It's going to join across names. Dan Gujo is equal to Canada. Well, that doesn't match. That's why natural joins are bad. Yes, you can do it if you've designed your database a very specific way so that your primary keys, are the names are never reused. You never reuse column names, ever. So if you have a customer table, it's a customer ID. In the orders table, it'd be customer ID. Great. You could never have, say, a column called created date, like just created in both, just so you know, this date, this record was created, because it'll try to use that for a join. That's not useful, especially if it just so happens that created in one table happens before the foreign key. Suddenly things are out of whack. It's going to try to do that join. Like I said, natural joins are cool if you design your database a very specific way. But it's also like you're walking down the hall with your eyes closed and hoping you're going to find the door. If the hallway is always exactly the same, the same length, every hallway, your entire life is exactly the same, great, it's going to work. If it just so happens that, you know, they close, they put a little, this hallway is closed sign because they're mopping, you're done. So that's a natural join. Now, if a natural join fails, in other words, it fails, fails to find matching columns. It turns into something called a Cartesian join, also known as a cross join. Um, so what happens is a cross join combines each row of one table with every row of the other table, creating a matrix. And the easiest example, whoop, the easiest example I have of that is a deck of cards. Um, Every year, I, every term, I say I'm going to create a database with a deck of cards set up, and I keep forgetting. Okay, so we all know our deck of cards has spades, diamonds, 
hearts, spade, diamonds, hey, clubs. There we go. Thank you. And it goes from one to king, right? Ace to king. Blah, blah, blah to king, right? So imagine we had a database. Go show how, many, how often I play cards, eh? I play lots of card games, just not that involves like traditional cards. If we do a cross join, what it's going to do, it's going to go, okay, I'm going to start with this one. So it's going to return results that read like this. Spade A, spade one, spade two, spade three, blah, blah, blah. Then it's going to do diamond ace, diamond one, uh, diamond two, actually, there's no one. Diamond three, some more, and eventually we'll get to club king. So basically it takes every value in one table and maps it to every value in the other table, so you end up with a big giant grid. It has uses in scientific purpose, like if you're trying to create a matrix, you're trying to build up uh, you know, a list of values for pricing charts and stuff like that. Theoretically, yes, it's usable, but it's not very useful. Um, as you can see, this is a logical database work because we only need rows that somehow logically correspond in the two tables. Most of the time when people are trying to do Cartesian stuff like this, they actually do it in memory and don't get the database server to do it because there's probably other things they need to do to the data anyways. So cross joins are cool. They exist. I've been doing this for 20, 20, oh boy, 27 years. 26 years, 27 years, something like that. I'm old. And, um, I've never had to use this. I'm just saying, like, it exists. It's there if you ever have that use case. I've never seen it in the kind of work I do. I'll just be honest. Okay. So then we have something called an implicit join. So this is the old school join syntax. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because it's been deprecated. Like, it's not considered proper anymore. If you're working with Oracle, congratulations. There's a good chance you're going to have to do this, depending on what version of Oracle you've got and if the, if the install you have have paid the extra money to actually have proper joins. Yes, it's a paid-for feature in Oracle. Yeah, you can still do the old-school joins, but if you want the nice modern one, that for, at one point I know you had to pay for that feature. It's disgusting. Why do they have sole customers? Because they've locked you into their ecosystem. Like Oracle sales have been flat for the last 15 years. They have had n almost no new customers. Almost all of their new customers are people spinning up Oracle instances on Amazon. Because you don't, you just pay like a couple of dollars. I think a month, it'll cost you $100 a month. Whereas an Oracle license will cost you $40,000 out of the box. So it's hard to say how many customers they have because Nobody's buying licenses straight from Oracle anymore, except for Amazon and Microsoft and Rackspace. So this is an implicit join. You can see that in the middle of the example, this is right from the textbook. Select star from retail orders, comma, order items, where. So this is, it's like you do in the from, it's a common delimited list of tables. And then you define how things are connected in the where clause. This is how we used to do joins back in the day. We listed off every table in the from clause, and then in the where, you would do all your join operations from there, like you do your, your quality operations. When I get to the actual proper join syntax, I'll explain to you what, what I'm talking about, these you know equality items. But the worst part of this was, let's say you decide to join three tables, and you forgot one of the where clauses. So suddenly you had an inner join, Multiply by cross join, and it would just happen. It wouldn't even warn you. It just you just sat there and you wondered why your query took so long. So they're fine. And often when you go looking online on how to do a join, you'll find a lot of examples like this. It's not considered proper anymore. But it's like anything else, they made sure it still works because there's code going back 30 years. And there's programmers that go back 30 years that refuse to learn how to do things the, the proper way. So they let you keep writing it the old way. So the results of this query would look like this. Um, it returns literally 
the content from both tables as one long row. Um, now you'll notice a little note at the bottom, and I'm actually going to demonstrate this in a minute. Um, essentially, it's saying if a field name is the same in both tables, you need to add the table name in the field list. And I'll show you guys that in a moment why. Uh, I'll be using actually the flight DB for that one to show you that example, uh, because that one has fields that are the same in multiple tables. Okay, so a regular join is essentially what's called an equi-join. It's saying that it uses values in both tables where they're the same when you're joining across it. It'll be, once I show you guys the proper join syntax, I'll drop into to demo mode. I'm just trying to get rid of this, this stuff out of the way first. Um, you can, they say, multiple joins can be used to process three or even more tables. I guarantee, lab nine, you're going to be querying five or six tables for one of the questions. Just warning you now, people uh, complain about lab nine. It's okay. You're supposed to suffer once in a while. All right. So here's another example. But in this case, we're just listing specific columns. Again, it's still an implicit join. I don't want to spend a lot of time on this. So now we're going to do the join on syntax. and the join on keyword is placed between table names and it also has a on clause. So we got a join, you got an on, it'll be easier when I demo it. And then you don't need the where anymore. So that piece of the where goes away because of the join syntax. The explicit join syntax is currently considered the proper way to write joins. Um, it still works, but it's archaic. All right. I'm going to go switch over to my Huh? I have no idea what you're saying. <laughs> okay, select star from uh, airports. Actually, I could have used this one because it actually has the data. Join countries on uh, countries.id is equal to airports country ID, I think. I'm just winging this, I, if I can remember this properly. Yes, fantastic. Okay, so this is the flight DB. This is the database you guys are using in your labs. So some of these examples will probably be useful for you guys. So when I did this, you will see that there's the entire airport record up to here. And then suddenly you will have an ID and a name over here. And this is the country's table at the end. So it's taking one and it's tacking it on to the other. And earlier I was talking about how you have to be explicit about your call name. So I'm just going to say the word name here. And you might have noticed that in the airport, the name exists and the country, the name exists. So I'm going to run this and we're going to get an error. The error reads for those at the back who can't see the screen. Uh, column name, literally in quote marks, because we're looking for the name column, in the field list is ambiguous. That's the database server saying, I have no idea which name field you want. So you have to prefix it with the table name. So I want to go airports.name. Ta-da. Now, this allows us to do a few interesting things. We can go where uh, countries.name is equal to, oh, let's go to Brazil today. Here's our Brazilian airports. Fantastic. Yes. No, this is a f an inner join. It's not a natural join because we are explicitly naming the columns where things are connected. So. Let me just sweep this so that it's a little clearer. Okay. So I did the select at the top. That's nothing new. From airports, that is also nothing new. What is different is this. The join syntax. So it's saying, I want to grab from airports, join countries, 
So it's saying, okay, now I want to also grab data from countries. The on clause is saying this join is going to get matched on the on this clause. So it's saying the ID of the countries matches the airport's country ID. And now it knows what the connection is between the two. So essentially, the, the primary key of countries is ID. The foreign con the foreign key in airports is country ID. Normally, joins are done from primary key to foreign key. Once you figure out what you know the things that are in common between them, you can include them in the join, and magically this works. That you could actually do a part in the phrase for the young ears in the room, a bastardized version of this. and do something horrifying like this. So remember the implicit join? So this is a join that joins an implicit join and it will theoretically, I hope I don't make a liar on myself. It will work. Should you ever do this? No. Why? Because it actually did a, nat it did a natural join it tried to do a natural join, then it read the where clauses. Oh, he didn't want the natural join. He wants to do it this way. So then it has to back out, redo its query plan, and execute it again. What is cool about doing it this way is even before it processes the where clause, it's already filtered out how things are connected. So if there happens to be an airport without a country ID, those will get excluded. Um, there's all kinds of nifty things we can do with this. Um, you know, in here, we can actually get cool. We can do a list. And eventually in here, we'll find some Canadian airports, probably. Oh, there's Kirken Lake and Manitouage. Horn Payne. Well, we're in northern Ontario. Marathon, Ré de Fontaine, Horn Payne, Kirken Lake, Manitouage. Wawa. Okay. Oh, you can have as many joins as you want. Oh, absolutely. Which is where I'm headed with my next example. I'm join routes on uh, routes dot source airport ID is equal to airports. Now you will notice that I wrote this one a little differently. I did it to demonstrate one thing. The order of the columns in your join, your on clause is not important. Like whichever is the primary key and the foreign key, it doesn't make a difference what order you put them in because it is gonna evaluate them the same way. So I'm gonna run this. And I got a typo because I'm highlighting something. There we go, let's try that again. Great. Now, what's weird now is we've got multiple entries for each one. Um, basically, put if I put in and it's roots, not root ID. And now you can see that it's showing the IDs and the different roots. Uh, this allows us to do a few different things. Um, because we could also find out like such. And now um, I can I should put slap a distinct on that because. These are taking a little longer to run now, as you can tell. Uh, when I'm recording my lectures, it really kills the performance of my database, and I don't know why. So you can see the name of the uh, airport and what airline flies out of it. Specifically, this is using the source. So when you're looking at these labs, the source is where the plane takes off. Destination is where it lands. So these are all airlines that take off at a given airport, which is actually a useful query for some people. Um, and then if I wanted to go and go where 
uh, countries dot name is equal to make the Brazilians happy again. And now you can see which airport and which airlines fly out of that given airport. And you know, so yes, you can have as many joins as you want. I just did three. I could keep going. I could join uh, the routes aircraft table, and I could tell you which plane flies that route, which is basically like one of the answers for the lab. So I'm not going to do it in class, but it's you're not that far from it. Like I've got like half the lab done for you on this example. Okay, so cool. Now. Let's just say we want to find, there's the other kinds of joins. So this is known as an inner join, a full inner join, or just a join. Like if you're trying to do an inner join, a full inner join, you can just shorten it down to join. When you do a join, it's known as an equijoin. It's saying that it has to have everything that exists on the left and the right must match. And remember, is it last week? I think I was telling you guys about, you know, how queries are read left to right, regardless of how many top to bottom, left to right. So in this case, what this means is it goes from left and keeps going until that's to right. So in a minute, when I start talking about left joins and right joins, it'll make more sense. So these are full inner joins. I'm going to go back over here, select star from customers, customers, join orders on orders.customer ID. Uh, Customers.id. So I'm going to run this query and I got a typo because it's called There, so we got customers and their orders. You can see that we got repeats already with Kirsten Moore because she's got three orders. Cool. Now, in theory, I could do a natural join on this if I wanted to, because it just so happens that my primary key, my foreign keys have the same name and neither tables have repeated column names. So this is one of the few examples where this would work. When I designed this database, I literally designed it with this in mind. Um, so in theory, I could take all this off and it should look exactly the same. Or not. Oh, ooh, my laptop just got hot. Oops. Stop. Stop. Uh, database server was not restarted. Nice. Is this gonna work? Did I just totally murder it? Oh, ooh. Okay, so that's why you don't do natural joins. I don't even know why that didn't work because that should have worked. <laughs> um, instead, it just tried to do a cross join. Wow, that was impressive. Is it going to work now? Okay, Whew, we're back. Um, oh, my fan kind of turned off again. <laughs> I really didn't like what I was trying to do. All right, so what we can do is there's something called the left join. I really don't know if this data set's going to work for this. Uh, let's go right to the end. And this data set does not work for this. Okay, so let me explain what a left and a right join does. And then I'm going to go through the slides and see if I missed anything important. So what a left join will do is it'll grab everything from customers and any matches in orders. If there's nothing in orders, it'll return nulls. So what it means by left join, it says, select everything from customers. When, when it reads left join, it's saying, give me everything you found beforehand. And then anything you might find here. I really thought this had the data set for that. Um, I was positive that I had the data set for this. Why would you do that? Okay, so he's asking, why would you want to do a left join or a right join? Normally you do left and right joins when you're not 100% sure that the data is all there. Um, a good example would be you need to pull out a customer list 
And some customers may have a ship to address and some may not. So you still want to know all the customers, regardless if they have a ship to address or not, but by the same token, you still want to pull out a ship to. So that means if the customer, you'd get the customer's normal address and if they had a ship to address, it would fill that in. Otherwise it would return nulls. Um, I'm just surprised I didn't set it up that way because it should be set up that way. No, no, you could use it for a variety of reasons. Um, how many customers do I have? 500. Okay, I didn't lose my mind. It's just my SQL is being stupid, not showing me all the records. Okay, so here's what's happening. Look down here. So if I do a straight join, I get 1,500 rows back. So the number's really small. It's right over here, guys, right at the bottom. 1,500 right here. So if you try to do it yourselves and you type this query, if you did grab this database, you'll see that it shows 1,500 rows returned. Okay? So if I do a left join, I knew I didn't, I didn't slack off and I set up this data set. Now you'll see that number went up. Now, let me show you what this is. So if I go uh, customers.name, comma, orders.order ID, and I go run, so we don't have as much data, and we scroll through this. Oh, there was one. Right here. So this is pulling a customer called Noel. Ratliff. However, she never placed an order. So she's in the customer's table registered, but she never placed an order. So this is a dead customer in all sense and intents and purposes. So in this case, we could use it for data cleanup. We're trying to find dead customers. We could prune off customers that way. Maybe we want to set up an email mailer list to email customers that have registered and didn't buy anything so we can start spamming them. Come buy our stuff. I guarantee it's cool. I'll give you a 50% off coupon. You know, we've all gotten those emails, haven't we? So that's sometimes that's how those emails show up because you registered for a site to look at their stuff and then you didn't buy anything. Um, that is what a left join does. A right join does the opposite. It'll give you everything from customers. Actually, I refer that it would give you everything from orders with any customers it has, but you can't have an, an order without a customer, so you couldn't do it that way. I could quickly flip these around though. I could go uh, orders, right join customers, and that will give me the exact same result. Uh, because all it is, I flipped it, right? So eventually, if I scroll down through this, I'll find, oh, there was Noel. Oh, Michael this time. So Michael Lawson. So all I did is I flipped the tables around to do the left and the right join. So what it's saying is it says, give me everything from customers, right join. So in other words, saying, I want every, I mean, sorry, every, everything from orders and right join customers. In other words, they're going to give me everything from customers and any things it finds that might match to the right. So it allows unmatched records to be returned. That's what a left and a right join does. The most common use for it would be one, data cleanup, uh, two, for reporting, where sometimes you might not have, um, like there are countries that don't have postal codes. Maybe you need to find people in countries that don't have postal codes. Yeah, or, you know, a lot of that uh, Pacific, small Pacific countries where the mailman literally knows the name of every person on the island. There's uh, 26 people and they're all related to each other living on this island. The, the postman's the uncle. He knows everybody's mail. The, the boat comes by, drops off a box and gives everybody their mail. Great. They got their mail once a year. But did we use it for stuff like that where you may need to retrieve data? Like 
one example is literally happening to me at work um, where the company that bought, that acquired the company I work for, they now want our data out of our accounting system and they've asked me to extract customer lists out of our accounting system. Not all customers have discount terms. That's a left join because I need to grab the whole customer, but not everybody gets a discount. Therefore, we're not going to have anything coming out of the business type table. Um, so those are left and right joins. All right, so how many slides did I just blow through? Okay, there's the join on syntax. I covered that one. Um, this has, you know, if you're not 100% sure what I just did, go through these slides because they'll, you know, cover it a little more detail, like with pictures. Um, and this is just showing how you can just literally do the join on everything, um, which is cool. So I'm actually going to do, um, here's a multi-table join. I did that. And it's just, the joins are just getting more and more complicated, right, in the slides, but they're all doing the exact same thing I just did. What they are doing, though, is you'll notice that they are putting in aliases for each of the tables in here, which is cool. It's fine. It's because they just don't want to have to keep typing in the big, long table name every single time they use it elsewhere. So you'll notice that um, retail order RO, RO joined here, but then if you alias the table, you actually have to call it this way. So that's the one takeaway from this slide, both the aliases. Um, so this is the logic of the joins. I So essentially, this is the full join where it only matches things that match across. So it'll find these two. Um, that's just, they're aligning the data and the table to show you how we would find it. In a join, the nulls are ignored. So if you have a left join, there'll be, it'll find it, the, the records don't exist. So technically they're null. So that's what the left and the right joins are for is when you may have nulls, as in an absence of records in this case, not an absence of value. If it's joining on a foreign key and the foreign key is required, you'll never have a null. But if the parent table never had a child record created, then the entire child table is a null as far as the parent table is concerned. Right? If you've never had kids, your children are null. If you've had kids, they're not null. There's an example right there. Right? So, I shouldn't. Sorry. Um, but yeah, that's exactly it, right? So, to answer your question about, you know, can you join across a null? No. You could actually go where table one, nah, you, can, you could theoretically say, where the the foreign key is equal to null or is null. And then, sure, I'll show you. Or it's even better if I just show you. Okay, this is cool, right? So if I were to turn around, I said where order ID, oops, ID is null, there's all my customers that are null. It's because none of these customers have an order. Therefore, as far as the customer is concerned, the entire order table is null. Therefore, that's how you can find records that don't have a match. That's just a cute trick. That's probably not in any of the slides. But that is how you you do this. If you're trying to find the records that don't have matches for data cleanup, as he mentioned, that's where that would come in. Okay, so... <clears throat> These slides use Venn diagrams for this. Venn diagrams are really stupid for this uh, because Venn diagrams are for set operations and joins are not sets. Um, we're actually going to talk about sets at the end, um, but they're not set operations. So the inner join syntax, as you've seen here, what it'll do is it only find records where the match exists in both tables. That's what the Venn diagram here is trying to show you. It's saying, okay, in the join, in the on clause, where this value is equal to that value, it'll be that subset of the records. So that's what the Venn diagram is showing. And this is an inner join. And whoever drew the slide forgot to fill in the middle. This should be colored. Um, left outer joins, right outer joins. I discussed that already. Um, it matches a left returns records on the left table. 
and a potential matches from the right, a right outer join will do the same thing. You will notice that you do not need the word outer. When I did my left join, I never included the word outer. The word outer is optional in the syntax. The SQL language allows you to take a lot of shortcuts with the writing, and in practice, very rarely will we see a, an actual developer use left outer join, unless they've been out of school for three weeks. Then they'll just, after you know, two weeks in the field, they'll realize that, why, why do I need to type this? I forgot to type it in and it worked. Um, and here's an example of the left outer join. And then the right outer join does the exact same thing. So this has an example of the right outer join. Um, you won't need these for any of the labs. <laughs> um, comparing subqueries to joins. Subqueries and SQL joins both process multiple tables. Yes. A subquery can only be used to retrieve data from a uh, top table. In other words, whatever tables at the outermost layer of all the subqueries is where the data comes from. Um, a join can be used to obtain data from an, any number of tables, including the topmost table. And this is where the whole aggregate thing comes home, and it's really nifty. So if I go, let me just turn this around so that it's looking exactly the way I wanted it to. Uh, no, I don't want to do a left join because I want only customers to have orders. Join order lines on... All right, so I'm going to do this and not unique table customers. Oh, all right, fantastic. Here's our now we've got a lot of rows coming back 3,000 rows. That's because I am, um, it's literally showing all the order lines. So if I threw in the order line ID, you'd see each of the lower order line IDs. However, let's say I want to know what the total is for every order for every customer. I could go comma sum total. And of course I just did the uh, the big evil of my SQL. I just ran a query that means absolutely nothing. Well, we know it's that's the total. We knew that total last week when I did this example. A group by customers dot name comma orders dot order underscore ID, and I go go, and now I've got my customer, what their order was, and what the table was. And let's say I don't care about what orders they actually had. I could remove the order table completely out of my data set, and it'll show me my total per customer. You will notice that not once am I as the orders table being used to display or to group. It's just being joined, it's being used as the linkage between a customer and the order lines. So it's allowing you to jump through a table to get at the next table. You need to do it, you could do this as a subquery, yes. Would it be efficient? No. Uh, would it make more sense for some people? Maybe. It just depends how your brain is wired. When I first started, left school, I understood subqueries way more than joins. I abused the ever living crap out of subqueries until my boss at the time sat down with me and he took the time to explain to me what joins were for properly. And then he explained to me the ramifications of what I was doing to their poor database server. Because back then, the server had eight megabytes of RAM. I think it might have been running a Pentium 1. Uh, for those of you that don't know what that means, it's a pro server that was running, counts the speed of the process measured in megahertz, not in gigahertz. It took a long time to run these queries. Eight megabytes of RAM, and it had a 200 megahertz processor. The RAM in your laptop probably runs at 2,400 megahertz. You know, your RAM is significantly faster than the processor was in this machine ever. Um, so this query that runs on this machine in 0 0.016 second probably would have run on machine in probably 10 minutes. Just how slow things were. So a subquery might have made it take 15 minutes instead of 10 minutes. The joins are more efficient because it figures out how things are interconnected before it starts filtering, 
before it starts doing the math. It figures out how all the linkages are in the data. And as it starts going through them, it does it in a much more efficient manner. So this is, you know, using an aggregate in multi-line join to get from the customer to their order lines to find out how much they spent, which is cool. And of course, as always, oh, let's give this as a, We want to know our top five customers. You don't need to write a single line of Java to do that. Or a single line of PHP or a single line of Python or whatever your language happens to be. You can just do it with SQL this nicely. So to reiterate that this is basically a complete example of some of the stuff you'll need to do for the lab. You are going to connect from customers. You're going to join the orders. Then you're going to join the order lines to orders. So you're going to join customers to orders, orders to order lines. And then you are going to run a sum of the total, which is a column in the order lines. You're going to pull out the customer's name. You're going to group by the customer's name because you want to know the total per customer. And then you're going to do the uh, sort by the order total. I mean, in theory, we could turn around, we go with, uh, we want to know the regions. And now we know that Nova Scotia spent the most just by changing two things. So, you know, in Java, you would have spent another half hour writing this. No, really, I'm not, co I'm not joking. It probably, you'd have to create a new class or at least a new method, copy the code across, double check, make sure it works, write your unit tests, write your 16,000 lines of comments because the code is brutal. Then you got to run the unit test, make sure it works. Or you just write it as a single SQL statement. <laughs> and you just have all the SQL statements set up as uh, constants that you can just call. There are ways to make things efficient using SQL. Okay. Um, so this is the example where at the bottom where a subquery can only return what's at the topmost table. The join can return stuff from the any of the tables in between. All right, so the last piece of the this is the set theory. Um, so in math, there's a phrase called set theory to describe mathematical operations on sets. Did you guys ever learn about set theory? It's a good thing there's only three slides. We're not gonna the problem is, is that MySQL only supports one of the three set operators. So there's only so much we can do with it. Lads, why even bother? You knew you were going to get called out walking in this late. Uh, and it's recorded for posterity's sake, too. Um, so in math, there's something called set operations. It's when you are operating on sets of information where each set is a distinct group of items. A database table meets the definition of a set. In other words, the contents of a table or the results of a query is a set. Therefore, if you're going to connect two tables together, not using a join or subquery, you can use it as a set operation. So, Normally you use Venn diagrams. Remember earlier I snorked about how I hated the Venn diagram for joins because it makes no sense because Venn diagrams are about sets. A set's re rep represented by a circle. Like, did you guys learn about Venn diagrams in school? Some of you, yes. Some of you, no. Um, well, I took it in high school and then I took it again in college because Venn diagrams and sets are really important to business. <laughs> So a so you a set's represented by a single circle. Uh, everybody's seen Venn diagrams. I'm sure somewhere on Reddit you've seen a meme. That the Venn diagram is pretty much a universal word, no matter what language you speak. And well, and mind you, depending what country you come from, they might call it something else to pretend that one of their people came up with the idea. But it was a scientist called Venn, a mathematician called Venn, that came up with it. Um, 
I'm not going to talk about countries that pretend other people's creations exist and belong to them, uh, but there are countries that act like that. Um, so, okay, these are two sets. This is where the set overlaps. Okay, let's put in a third set. Fantastic. Now we got three sets, right? We got people. We've got cats. We've got dogs. Okay, this is a pretty simple set of information to understand, right? Number of people that have dogs. Peep dogs. People, cats. People with cats and dogs. These are dogs and cats without people, and they're all sad. Okay? Um, this is the pound. <laughs> or the adoption agency. So, the there's a couple of different sets. There is the or operation, which is in either of them. The and operation has to be in both. And then the complement. So, what we call them in the database world, though, is the union, the intersect, and the complement. The complement is, um, man, I wish I had all my colored markers. Um, the complement in database is actually known as accept or minus. So the union is both sets combined. So that means what it'll do when you do union database, it'll give me all the people and all the cats together, the unique values of them. All the people, all the dog, dogs combined. Yeah, that'll give me all the people plus all the cats. Now, depending on how your data is set up and you just, let's say you just have a column called name, right? So let's say in here, in our people, we have, uh, and then we got our cats over here and we have our people here. So we got uh, Bob, uh, Rish, and uh, James. Okay. And in our cats, we just happen to have a Bob and then a uh, Snurt and a Cuddles and a Bleep and a Bro. I'll let you guess which of those four are my cats. Because the four of those are my so four of those cat names are from my house. Okay, so if we were to do a union, it would be Bob, Faris, James, Snurt, Cuddles, Bleep, and Bro. It'll give me the unique values from both sets. It'll always give me so if in SQL, which I'm gonna pull up in a second. Actually, I've got three sets of examples right here. I'd rather use those examples on what's in the slides. So the union gives me everything from the first table plus any values in the second table that are found in the first table. Or I should say the first query. So it runs the first query, extracts all the unique values, runs the second query, finds any values that do not exist yet, and provides you those. So that is the union. The intersect, on the other hand, would be where the value is the same in both. So this is the intersect, this set right there. So in this case, all we get is Bob. And then if we did a, the last one, which is the accept, also known as a minus, also known as a complement, although the word complement is never used in the database world, it's always except or minus, it would go, give me all the peeps minus the cats. So it'd go, oh, Bob's in both, so we're not gonna include Bob. It'll give us Farish and James. Nothing from cats, just from here. Now, I'm just gonna go back a few slides. Um, so, 
The unit operator is fairly straightforward. The intersect operator is, like I said, it grabs what's in the middle of the Venn diagram. The issue is, is that MySQL 8, and obviously before 8, does not support intersect. That's why you do not have a lab on set operations. Microsoft Access does not support it either. And you have the accept operator. Oracle calls us minus instead of accept. Everybody else calls it accept. And again, Access and MySQL don't support it because in their infinite wisdom, the developers of MySQL have said people have been using MySQL for the last 17 years without it. They don't need it now. Which is actually why we never could use MySQL in, my, in the company I work for. Because we actually use unions and accepts and intersects all the time when some of our data sets. Um, a common use for these kinds of operations um, would be um, you want to find out all the email addresses for customers. So you go to a trade show. Do you guys know what a trade show is? Some people say no, some people say yes. Say. So a trade show is when a company, it's a where it's basically a big giant, they rent a big giant space and all these companies that have similar, that work in the same industry, all get together and showcase their products. Company I work for, we, we participate in eight to 10 trade shows a year. And, you know, we will have, we, at the company I work for, we deal in the print industry, signs and, you know, you know, when you see those cars that have big giant stickers on the side that are wrapped, that's what it's called, the car is wrapped. And I'm not referring to Atasha's, talking like, you know, plumbing vans and stuff like that. Um, that's the industry we work in. So we'll go to our trade shows for like car detailing, for sign making, for large format printing. We support garment printing, direct to, like direct, whatever, direct to garment printing, like his t-shirt. It's probably printed, the 50th chance it was printed with our software. We support 80% uh, of the government printers in the mar on the market. So just saying. Um, so the what happens is they go to the trade show. When we leave, the trade show organizers will send us a list of everybody who visited our booth because there's like a little scanner as soon as you come into the booth. And if you want to know more about their products, you just tap your 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 pass to it, and then it adds to a list, and then we'll get a list of people that we want to contact. So then we would we would do is we'd run queries against that data compared to our customer list, and we want to find anybody who's new. So then we do a complement and accept, select everything from the leads except for the ones that are already in our system. On the other hand, maybe we want to only contact the ones that are already there so we can give them a discount on an upgrade. Select everybody from leads, where their email address exists in our list, intersect. And then the unit, maybe we want to just spam everyone. So therefore, select everybody from our customers plus anybody who's fresh and new in the leads. And that's the union. So that's where you use these three operations. Um, okay. No, we're not done today. I know people were hoping. No, no, this is just, I want to give you guys the last little bits you guys need for your assignment today. Because this gets you to 95% of the assignment as of today. Okay, I just want to get you guys at that last little bit. This is actually the start of next week's lecture, so that means the next week's lecture will be shorter. So, that's all good. Here, come on, week 13 lecture. Oh, man. Okay. Okay. I'm only going to talk about views for about 20 minutes, and then I'll pick it up next week, but I want to at least get the basic concepts down for you guys. Okay. A view is a named query. And every time a view is called by its name, it actually executes the query on the inside. A view allows you to hide the table and shows only a subset of what's in it. Complex queries that need to be executed frequently can be saved as a view for easier access. Now I'm going to say something that would upset my database prof that I had in college. We didn't have web browsers then, so that really didn't apply. Think of the view as a bookmark in your web browser. You know you got those nice, big, fat, long URLs? 
And then you bookmark it and you rename it to anime. And you save that, right? Because that's, you know, whatever link you thought was interesting, you want to remember that topic. So you click on the word that says anime and it actually fills in the big long URL for you. Same idea, kind of. Obviously a lot more involved, but it's the same idea. So how do you create the view? In actual fact, I'm going to go through the steps and then next week I'll actually go through the slides. Okay, so I'm going to come here. So see, I got this nice complex query, this this one right here. And I, I am going to run it just to show you guys that I didn't break my query. So a view, this is what, I'm, what you need for your assignment is known as a dynamic view. A dynamic view is run, it runs the inner underlying query every time. You create it as follows. Create view, call it whatever you want. Top five regions as, and then the rest of the query. So what this is gonna do, it's gonna create a bookmark in your database. It's not a bookmark, but it's gonna create a bookmark in your database called V top five regions. I tend to prefix my views with V, but that's just a me thing. You call them whatever you want. Um, and then when I run this, It'll say zero rows affected. Cool. If I go select star from V top five regions, it gives me the exact same thing as I had before, except how much did I just type compared to the first time? Do I even need to know what's happening behind the scenes? No. Views are cool because you can use them to abstract the underlying structure. You can hide the structure of the database from the application. Um, there is this one piece of software called Remedy. I think it's, it's probably still around. Remedy was used in call centers. So, you know, you call 1-800, my computer's broken. And then they'd answer. And, for example, Compaq used Remedy for their own products. And Remedy, you'd have a form designer. So the person that actually designed the forms would design the forms and Remedy would create views in the database so that nobody actually needs to know what the structure of the database is because it just uses views. So if I want to, I can drop the view by that, then it'll just be gone. Poop, no error message. So now if I try to run it, it goes, the table does not exist. I'm gonna recreate my view as such. All right, so as far as the database engine is concerned, the view is a table. It's not a table, it really does know it's a view. But it looks like a table. It smells like a table. It works like a table. And if you include the primary keys or any indexed columns, the indexes will also be used. So it has pretty much the exact same performance as if you wrote the original query by hand. It's all good. Um, forever. It is an object. It is not ephemeral. In other words, it's not temporary. It is permanent. Like I could reboot my laptop, it would still be there when it came back the next day. It is part of the database structure. If I refresh this and I close my tables and I open up my views, oh no, wrong database, views, there it is. It's permanent. That's that's why these are called dynamic views. A dynamic view will run the underlying query every single time. So every time I run it, it literally runs that big fat query for me. That's why I call it, it's like a bookmark, as in it knows what the original query was. It will run the whole thing, but it you don't need to know what made it up originally. 
you can use it in joints. You can use it in subqueries. You can use it for pretty much anywhere you can use a table. You can use a view. It's very cool. And it will be the exact same performance. Well, like a tiny, tiny little hit off the top while the database server figures out if it's a view or a table. But it goes, it's a view. Then it goes, what's this view do? Oh, it's an SQL statement. And it runs that. It gets a little fancier once it starts doing joins and stuff like that. And I'll talk about what the implications are of that next week. But I wanted to show you guys how to create the views for your assignment. Because you know task four where it tells you to create two views? Literally, like task four is points given to you. It's no harder than this. Um, I just wanted to make sure you guys actually saw how to create the views. Uh, they, we actually have a pile of slides. Like there's like 46 slides on uh, views, indexes, and transactions. Um, so I'm um, that that was basically the views here. Um, how to create the view. Um, there's a, actually a few other pieces here. Um, you'll see the create or replace view. Actually, why am I back in PowerPoint? There, no, this one. All right. Create or replace view. Let's just say you want to change the underlying structure of the query, but you don't want to have to drop the view first. You can do or create or replace. So if you do or replace, it'll go, oh, I already have a view called this. It'll basically rewrite the definition of the view. It just replaces, just like when you update your bookmarks and you change the URL of your bookmark, same deal. Um, the rest of it I showed you guys already. So what was that? Yeah, that's what I'm saying, or replace. So it's optional. It's only when something already exists. So a bit like if you do a drop database if exists, it'll drop the database if it exists. If it doesn't, it doesn't drop it. This will replace it if it exists. If it doesn't exist, it just creates it. That's why it's or replace, you know, create or replace. Um, name of the view, give it a name, and then whatever defines the view. Um, here's a sample of exactly what I just did on the screen. Um, and then you can do select star from hospital, which, you know, is the same thing I just did. <clears throat> now, in some database servers, you can't, do, can't use create or replace. In Microsoft SQL Server, for example, you have to use alter view, not create or replace. So this is just showing you that, you know, there's another syntax depending what database engine you're using. Uh, if I remember right, MySQL will just blow up if you try to do this. Unless that latest version I had you guys installed where that fixed it. Last time we did this in class, it blew up. So I'm like, blanket, it's probably gonna blow up on your install of MySQL. Um, so it's just showing them updating it again, dropping the view, fantastic. Um, so there's two kinds of views. There's dynamic views, which is what I just showed you guys. She asked me a few questions, you know, how does it pave? It, a dynamic view runs every single time. There's something also called a materialized view. Each view has an advantage and has a unique purpose. So a dynamic view is called a virtual table or a logical view. Some people also call it a derived table, which you'll notice when I use the subqueries, I also call it a derived table. Essentially, that derived table as a subquery is basically a, a, a temporary view. It creates a view and gives it that name, and then it throws it away when it's done. There's essentially all the same thing. It's just different ways of achieving the same target. The only difference is when you create the view, it's permanent. Whereas the other way, it's just temporary. Um, so the dynamic view does not occupy space. It does, but not like a lot, just the amount of text to create the view. Um, when invoked, it executes the underlying query. Fantastic. Complex query can be simplified by creating a dynamic view, which I showed you guys. Um, any changes made, this is the one danger with views. Views are cool. I use them a fair amount. However, if you change the underlying table and the structure changes and you're using a piece of that structure in a view, your view is going to break because it's referring to something that no longer exists. The view, the database, some database servers are smart enough, but most are not smart enough to know 
that there's views referring to certain tables. Like the view just exists as a query, and then you try to run the view on a table that's changed, and it just goes, bah -ha. too bad. Um, the dynamic view always gives you the most up-to-date information. Fantastic. It'll run the same speed as it normally would. And, you know, drop view. I showed you guys that already. So materialized views. MySQL apparently just got it. I was about to say MySQL does not have it. And I found out, like, literally last term, two weeks left in the course, that the version they released, like, that week, they had materialized views. So MySQL finally has materialized views. Uh, it's a feature that's been only been missing for 15 years. Because everybody else has had it for day one. A materialized view is a persistent view. It's a data set created from the tables, and it's actually stored in the data seat, occupies space. So that means it obviously it occupies space, therefore it's actually physically there. So every single time a materialized view is executed, it doesn't query the live data, it queries the stored data. Which leads us to why. So this is the syntax. If you were working on a database that supports materialized views, that's the syntax. Create materialized view, give it a name, as whatever. Okay? And if you want to drop it, it looks like that. So it's drop materialized view instead of just drop view. Um, and it's gone. Now, here's the difference between materialized views and dynamic views. Dynamic views are live. So, for example, let's, let's use this student body here as our dynamic view. Somebody got up and just walked out the door. The content in this room changed. Fine. If we created a materialized view of this, as I would take a, sing, a copy of every single person in this room, put them in another room. And every time I asked for the data, I'd go look in this other room instead of this room. It would show me a snapshot in time of that data. Now, some people are going to say, well, what's the point of creating a materialized view? And for that, I'll go with when you're dealing with very large data sets that queries can take a very long time to run, that's where materialized views come in. Amazon, I'm sure, uses materialized views. A manager will come in, and unless you're a really, really small store, you don't care about today's sales. You care about last week's sales, yesterday's sales. So what happens is every night, you'd run a refresh, which will be somewhere in here, where it's talking about the refresh and the materialized view. So it will, you have to run a command to refresh the view. So basically it retakes the query you had, reruns it, purges the data, and repopulates it. The way we used to do it in MySQL before we got materialized views would be, we'd create a table, insert everything into that table, and then at night, we truncate the table and then reinsert everything in the table. That's what a materialized view is doing. So what? why are materialized views good? Um, one, it's fast because it's summarized data. It doesn't need to run the underlying query. Um, two, it doesn't impact performance for everybody else. So I imagine you got a really big database and you got... I don't know, 10 sales managers that all log in at the same time and they want to know, you know, how did I do yesterday? How did my team do yesterday? How did my region do yesterday? And if you're using dynamic views or regular queries and they all hit the database at the same time, the whole server goes, hmm. yeah, a really good database server won't go, uh -huh. but, you know, if the data set's sufficiently large, it's going to hiccup and everything's going to get slow for a few seconds while it tries to catch up to these queries. If they're hitting up the materialized views, because at midnight when everybody's at home sleeping, it updates it. Nobody's affected. And now whenever these guys run their queries, it's only going to hit this materialized view without affecting anybody else. So materialized views are used for stuff that's not as important to have live. You don't care about today's sales. You don't care about whatever. That's what materialized views are for. Um, I do use them in some of our systems, um, specifically, come on, 
There it goes. If I log into this, and this is live data, and I click on the sales dashboard, that just, these are, these are coming out of materialized views that run every night. Do you saw how fast that loaded? This is summarizing data from um, 2011 to today. And it's showing basically, you know, the sales over years. Uh, it's also doing the last 12 months worth of sales out of a summary. So we can see, you know, how the performance is, number of sales versus totals. Um, this is the year over year. This is all coming out of materialized views. The only ones on here that's not, is the last seven days worth of sales because that's not worth doing the materialized view for. Not in this system. It's not heavy enough. And the weekly download trends. Why? Because they actually want to know how many people are downloading today. So materialized view is not that useful for that. Um, but yeah, this is an example where you use materialized view where you don't care about how fresh the data is as long as it's fairly recent. Usually in our cases, we run the, the refresh views every night as part of the process. Um, and that's the syntax for refreshing a materialized view. Uh, there's just a couple more examples, but you know, that's that. Um, okay, so this is where I'm going to stop because I'm going to talk, talk about updating views next week because it's really stupid. Um, and it's not going to help you guys with your your life or your assignment. So this is where we're at. Okay. Hey? It's just really hard to use. Update views never. <laughs>